almost a year to the date that these murders happened here in Moscow. We know that one of their most important pieces of evidence is, of course, the defendant's DNA at the crime scene. It impacted, like, a lot of people on campus. Yeah, most people try to, like, not bring it up because it's a sad subject to bring up upon, but everybody knows what happened, and everybody mourns, and everybody's upset about what happened. We never go to the bathroom alone, never, like, leave anywhere alone. No, I, I hope he gets put in jail or, like, prison for a while, yeah. And most, I mean, most people here do, like, nobody likes him. Welcome back. Monday will mark the first anniversary of the murders of Kaylee Gonzalez, Madison Mogan, Xander Carnoodle, and Ethan Chapin. And this morning, we want to shine a spotlight on their tragic deaths by taking a closer look at what we know about the case against the accused killer. Brian Kohlberger faces the possibility of the death penalty if he's convicted of these murders. And one of the main pieces of the evidence, of course, in this case, is his DNA on that knife sheath. I think the biggest piece of evidence that jumps out to you is the DNA evidence on the sheet. I think that's the that's the the one piece of evidence that will be hard to explain uh, as a defense attorney on the case. In the Sunday, Court TV is going to air the case against Brian Kohlberger, a Court TV special looking at the case from what we know about it. And uh, to help us along with that this morning, let's bring in criminal defense attorney, former CIA agent Jack Rice. He's up in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and producer, Court TV producer on Armis is here in studio. And let's start with the, the DNA because that clearly is the biggest bit of evidence from the state. That's the one where you're thinking, well, I don't know how he's going to get around it. And Anna, it's on th this. You know, this is obviously a, a replica. This is basically the same type of sheath that was found right there, right? And, and, and it came back positive for Kohlberger um, on the button. Right. Yeah, right here on this button. Nothing else had any of his DNA, um, allegedly, but this button did, did. And so it makes you wonder why. How did it get there? Jack Rice, uh, there are explanations, though, in, in our special, we talk about it. There's different ways that DNA can end up places where the person has never been, in a room they've never walked into, and objects they've never touched. Yeah, no question about it. Ted, I, I've had this happen in trials of my own where we found transfer DNA from clients who were actually never at a crime scene. And so that actually can happen. And that's the wild card here. This is something that the prosecution has to be conscious of and in, and in fact address it before the defense is allowed to. But this is the center point in many, many ways because in, in, in for a lot of people, I think we'll see this and they will say, with this DNA, unless you're arguing some vast conspiracy, it's hard to deny. You add up all of those other puzzle pieces and you put them together, this feels right. And that has real power, visceral power for a prosecution team. One of the things that the defense is likely going to bring up, Anna, is this, this house, the house on King, where Let's face it, it was a party house. Um, you've been there multiple times covering this uh, for Court TV. G give us a sense of uh, w what would you take away from it after you're you know, interviewing people and seeing the house. Um, there were a lot of people coming in and out. A lot of people coming in and out, and not just when these victims lived there, but for many years. One thing that you get a sense of is how close the houses are. You don't really get a sense of that just seeing the, the house on TV. The houses are closed. There's people walking all the time. Now, at night, it's very dark. Um, and it was even darker bef when the murders happened. Um, there was a light that was broken or, or just not working, and it wasn't fixed till after. So it's a very dark place at night. And clearly that sliding glass door seemed to be just sort of open, uh, and an open invitation for people that live there uh, that likely the killer used to walk in. But Jack, you referenced the other evidence. You've got the white Elantra willy-nilly driving around. Now, it does go out of frame during the actual time of the murders in terms of surveillance camera picking out up. But you've also has the defendant Kohlberger's cell phone, which is turned off. Uh, wow, at the time of the murders, imagine that. How, when you com combine all of it and we look at the state's case, well, what do you see? Right, this has everything. The Kohlberger case has forensics. 
It, it has location information. It has cell phones. It has the car. It has uh, uh, DNA crossing state lines. It has the use of, of a father's DNA to track backward to the son. I mean, this is 21st century criminal investigation 101. It truly is. And this is going to be the kind of a case that the state has to very slowly, meticulously build. They have to take these building blocks and put them together and say, let's talk about how we got to Brian Koberger. And if you do this slowly, meticulously, you want to make sure you don't leave any spaces for the defense team. This is what I've been doing for 25 years. My job is to push the seam of the state's case and to buckle it. And I'm always looking for that angle. And he's going to have good attorneys who are going to be working for him. And if the state screws up, they're going to find a way to push that space. And that's the problem that the state always has to be conscious of when they're working a case like this. Mm -hmm. Anna, you, you, uh, part of the, the, you know, the big part of this anniversary is going to be the just the feeling on campus, the, the sad reality of bringing it back for these students. And I you know you were out there when a lot of them went home. They were just, there was no arrest and people were scared. Um, and in the special on Sunday that's airing at 8 o'clock Eastern right here on Court TV, the, um, we had a chance, Chanley Painter drove with Steve Gonzalez on Kaylee Gonzalez's birthday in her vehicle. Um, talk about that, that, that vehicle. Um, let's first start about that vehicle because it was a big part of the case. She might not have even been there had she just she had just bought this car and she wanted to show it to her buddies but she she was on her way to a new job in Texas yeah she was on her way to a new job she was at her parents house and then she got this new car on her own she paid for it and she wanted to show it to her best friend Maddie and her other roommates and that's what made her go back to Moscow otherwise she may not have been there um, like Ethan he didn't live there and he was just there because of Zana um, and at the end of the day we don't know who or why what what brought Koberger allegedly over to the home? And Jack, to that point, he was his cell phone records um, did produce, according to the probable cause affidavit, that, that he was in the area twelve times over the five months before the murders. At least his phone was in the area near that house, and the families. The prosecution says, "Aha, he was stalking." It, it, does the state need to deliver a read? Let's face the guy has no connection to these people. Does the state need to tell a story of stalker man? Because that would make sense. The, otherwise, it doesn't make sense that this guy who's got his life together is a PhD. So what, what, why would he do this? Yeah, th this is the critical element, right? I mean, the problem with a piece of evidence like 12 times, you could make the argument on the other side that he is in the area. Like so many other people, thousands and thousands of people are there. What you have to do is put him at the scene. And that's what that DNA piece does. It takes the stalker concept of abstract into the specific. And so when you can convert that into something else, it changes how you look at the evidence. And that's so desperately what it is that you're trying to convince a jury to do, is to look at evidence a certain way. And if you do it successfully, they then can come forward and say, there's no other alternative but this. And that's what the prosecution is going to be focusing upon, I think. Yeah. And one of the things, Anna, that the families um, are also having to deal with is the fact that he did wait time. This is going to take a long time. And they're frustrated. They want, there's a gag order. They want everything out in the open. Um, and that's not the case. There's a lot we don't know. There's a lot we don't know. There's law enforcement who, behind the scenes, we get the feeling they want to speak, but they can't. They're, they're, they're gagged. And the families want to speak, and they can, but it seems like they're afraid. Um, there's a lot we don't know. There's a lot of puzzle pieces. What we don't have is the thread that puts it all together. Mm -hmm. And part of the special this weekend, uh, we kind of go into the different scenarios of, of what happened here. Did did Koberger run into Maddie, maybe, and Zana at the at the Mad Greek where they worked? Um, was it just this guy who had the crazy Reddit post? You know, he was looking for criminals to to weigh in on how how do you work? We talked to Siobhan Scott as part of this special, and um, uh, she studies the criminal mind, and here's what she's opined that they, whoever did this, um, this is the type of person. Take a listen. 
I see a theme with him for years um, in his online writings of going back and trying to make sense out of himself. And I think he was in that category of I'm studying all this because I want to understand myself. And so I think that was driving his research. There's also, in a rather perverse way, perhaps an attempt to develop some sense of camaraderie with other people and to get a sense of maybe I'm really not the only one who has these thoughts and feelings and experiences. What do his studies tell you about Brian Koberger? It's not that unusual for sadistic killers to study criminology. We think of the BTK killer in Kansas, the Golden State killer in California, both had criminology degrees and the California killer did go on to become a law enforcement officer, and there have been quite a few others. Jack, one of the things that uh, Steve Gonzalez told Chanley uh, Painter when she was you know, driving around with him and, and interviewed him multiple times is that, you know, he's gone back in his mind thinking, what did we as parents not do to prepare these kids? There's nothing these kids could have done. They, they did everything right. They literally just went home to sleep. And yet that's why, and they end up dead. Give us a sense of why, and you're a big part of the special too, why this story has hit home with so many of us. Ted, I'm, I'm a former prosecutor. Yeah, I'm a former CIA officer. I'm a criminal defense attorney. I handle murder cases and serious crimes. I'm also a father of four, and my youngest just started college. And I, you and I talked about this personally, so I'll bring it up. Is that is that my, my child? I'm sitting in an orientation room with all of these other families, and and I can feel the hope. I can feel how all of us are pouring everything we have into our children because we want them to be successful. That's what we want so desperately, and we feel it's palpable. Now those families in Moscow, they're the same. You send your children to college so they can succeed, so they can do something with their lives, so they can take on this legacy into the future long after we're all gone. The idea that somebody, anybody would come in and steal that, these are four murders, that is true. But this is these are four murders of families because how do you come back as a parent how do you come back and say, I can move forward now? I, I, I can't contemplate what it is that these families are feeling, what their pain is. And regardless of whether Brian Koberger is convicted, whether or not he gets a fair trial, whether or not he, he gets the death penalty, no matter what happens here, that never fixes that question, not really. And I think all of us watching understand what it is to be in that space where you're saying, I just want my child to have every opportunity I can make available. And then to have that stolen from them is a brutality that I think few of us can even fathom. Mm. Yeah, well said. Jack Rice, enjoy your weekend. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. You can catch Jack uh, um, here on Court TV um, Sunday during the special. Anna worked very hard on it. <laughs> Congratulations to you. It, it, did, it turned out very good. Thank you for joining us as well. You can watch the case against Brian Kohlberger this Sunday night, 8 o'clock Eastern Time, 7 o'clock Central.